Guys, are you guys? What's the word I'm looking for? <clears throat> you guys are wonderful. Okay, I'll go with that one. I'll go with that. Sure. No, no. You guys are are, are living dangerously because um, something's missing off that back wall there. <laughs> but I don't see it. I, I don't see it. So, what time is it? Here? <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> living dangerously, living dangerously. Yes, the clock is off that. I stare at that clock all the time. And uh, I did see the new clock. I like it, by the way. It's nice. But right now I can't see it. So um, you guys are living dangerously, like I said. I just want to do something here while I am uh, getting ready here. While, you're, while I'm getting ready, you can get ready and open up to the book of Romans, chapter 1. We are going to be, oh my God. <laughs> Roger just put the clock right up the aisle. Oy vey, oy vey, oy vey, oy vey. All right, okay. Romans chapter 1, let's pray. Hallelujah. Father. I thank you for your presence this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you are an awesome God. I thank you that you are a good, good Father, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you've called us deeper into your love, God. I thank you, God, that you've given us such an incredible hope for the future. You're our living hope now. <laughs> You're our living hope now and a hope for great things to come. I pray that you would open up the eyes of our understanding this morning. Open up our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what the Spirit wants to feed us this morning. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. And amen. I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures today because I really want to lay out a strong foundation and... Um, this is going to be part Bible study, part exhortation, part teaching, part preaching. And I don't know which part's going to be the more part, but we're going to have all those parts put together. And I hope to impart to you something that will encourage you uh, and build you up in your faith. Amen? So, of course, everyone realizes that last week we celebrated Easter. And uh, here in Romans, by the way, today's message title is Kiss the Sun. Now remember earlier this morning what I told you to remember? Adorante phileum, Latin, worship the sun. I just learned that, so I, I wanted to practice it. Adorante phileum. I have a reason for saying that, but I'll, I'll get to that later. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, help me here. I told Marsha yesterday that this, what I want to present today, really has at least two, if not three, layers to it. And any one of these layers could develop into a huge, beautiful tree. But I can't do that on a Sunday morning. So I'm going to try and to... to Bring it all together in the most concise manner that I can. In Romans chapter 1, we're going to pick up a verse 2. God, which he promised, he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, 
and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now you might just think that that is just a salutation greeting. But this verse is pregnant and it's dripping with messianic and Davidic covenant language. Paul is telling us here, of course, that in the flesh Jesus was born of the seed of David because Paul is thinking in his mind into into those, those who he's writing of the Davidic covenant, which I'm going to get to a little bit in a moment. But he was declared to be the Son of God. How? By the resurrection from the dead. He is both the Son of God and the Son of Man. And in, and in, uh, in relation and in regard to Israel specifically, the nation of Israel, he is the Son of David. And as I said a moment ago, it is a, Son of David is a messianic title, dripping with a very specific meaning. But turn with me. To Matthew 22. Because I'm going to lay a bit of foundation here. Matthew chapter 22. Verses 41 through 46. Let me know when you're there. (laughs) While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Remember, Christ is Greek for Christ in Greek is Christos, comes from the Hebrew Mashiach, Messiah. The Messiah, the anointed one, whose son is he? Jesus is playing a little bit of a game with them. Jesus knows this stuff already. It's not like he was asking something he didn't know. He wanted to see what they were going to say. It was a test to some degree. It was a test on their, their ideology. It was a test on their theology. And they said to him, the son of David. Jesus says to them, well, how then does David call him in, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is a direct quote from Psalm 110 verse 1. Jesus is challenging them. If he's the son of David, how is David calling him Lord? If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor did anyone question him anymore. Because either they got it, and they didn't want to get it, or they were really confused. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Well, you see, Paul just told us in Romans chapter 1 that he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Amen? We just read that. But now I want you to go over to verse, I mean, to Acts chapter 2. Going to lay some more cement in the foundation. Because not only did Jesus reference the Psalms and this particular Psalm, Peter did the same thing in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. I'm going to just pick up in the middle of Peter's sermon. We can't go through the whole thing. But Peter is speaking to Israel. Remember, the day of Pentecost, they they were were in the upper room. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. They all came out glorifying God in in, in different languages. And everyone had been gathered there in Pentecost because it was a pilgrimage feast. So, and and they were Jews. They were were Judean Jews. They were uh, uh, Hellenistic Jews. They were Jews from, from all over the world there. But they were Jews. And Peter says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, do you know that David was a prophet? Sometimes he just called him the sweet psalmist of Israel. But the psalms are full of prophecies. David was also a prophet of God. He was a king of God. He was the king of Israel. God made a covenant with him, which I'll get to in a moment. But he was also a prophet of God. 
Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him, had sworn with an oath to him, what oath was sworn to David? The Davidic covenant in First in, in Second Samuel seven. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing God had sworn an oath to him that the that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ. To sit on his throne. The Davidic throne of the Davidic kingdom. He, David, foreseeing foreseeing this. Spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. That his soul was not left in Hades. Nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up. Of which we are all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out on this which you now hear and see. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, and he quotes what Jesus quoted, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the Bible tells us that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Remember that. Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He has been sitting there at the right hand of the Father since the time of his ascension into heaven. And Peter is explaining this to them. David didn't do that. David's dead. David's in the grave. Jesus is risen up. And he's sitting on a throne in heaven. And he quotes again that Psalm 110. Therefore, and it's Davidic. It, 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 It speaks of the Davidic covenant. The promises that were given to David. That of his seed, his his seed would sit on the throne of the kingdom forever and forever. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know. Who is Peter speaking to? The house of Israel. It was the day of Pentecost. They understood the covenants. They understood the promises. Or at least they should have anyway. But, but Peter is reflecting out of that. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. That God has made this Jesus. Whom you crucified. Both Lord. The Lord. said so to my Lord. The Lord that ascended to heaven. He is the Lord. The son of David, whom David called Lord because he was a prophet, seeing him raised up. The Lord, you, he, he's made him both Lord and Christ, Messiah. They understood this language, trust me. They understood what he was saying. Jesus Christ is the seed of David, resurrected from the dead to sit upon the throne of David forever and forever. But I want to... Add a little bit more to this. He he is the one who will rule in the midst of his enemies. He is the Messiah. He is the son of David. But I want to show you something here. Turn to the turn to the original setting of the psalm. Turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Because I want to go from from verse 1 to verse 2. Jesus quoted verse 1. Peter quoted verse 1. By the way, Psalm 110, these verses are are used in other places as well as as, as, uh, Psalm 2, verse 7. We're going to get to Psalm 2 in a moment. I'm I'm building up um, my momentum here and laying the foundation. But we're going to get to Psalm 2 in a moment where we're going to kind of hang out for a while. But I want, I want you to see the context because Jesus, again, is, is, is speaking this Davidic language, this prophetic, messianic, millennial, if you will, language. But I might be jumping ahead of myself by saying that, but let's look what he reads, what, 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 what David wrote. The prophet of God, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That was what Jesus quoted. That's what Peter quoted. Very next verse. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. <laughs> I love it. Rule. I'm going to shout it from the rooftops, my friends. I'm going to shout it from the mountaintops. Jesus is coming back. And he will reign from Jerusalem. He will reign from Mount Zion. And no one is going to stop him. He's going to rule and reign in the midst of his enemies. Could somebody say amen? amen? But Paul, I'm going to go back to Acts. Didn't I tell you we're going to use a lot of scripture today? Because there's a, there's a thread here. Because Paul is making the same corollary, corollary, excuse me, corollary 
between the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. That was the sign that he was the son of God. Remember what we started with in Romans. Declared to be the son of God by the resurrection of the dead. This day I have begotten you. Of course Jesus was begotten of God before that. But this is when he he proclaims it, he declares it for all to see. Yes, when the Holy Spirit came down upon him at his baptism, the skies were opened up and said, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. But that was in in a limited sphere of experience. The resurrection of the dead is explosive. It's for the whole world to hear. It's for the whole world to see. It's for the whole world to experience. I could never experience, I could never, never experience the day that Jesus got baptized and the skies were open, hearing that, this is my beloved son who I will please. But I can experience and do experience, and we all do experience when we're born again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For if the same spirit that lives in, that, that raised Christ within now lives in you, he will raise you up. And we, and, and, and we, are, we, 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 we know that we are children of God because we, His Spirit is crying out and speaking to our spirit, witnessing to our spirit that we are children of God. Amen? I'm going off on a little bit of a bunny trail there. But I get excited about this because this is cool. <laughs> go to, go to I, 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 I want to show you what Paul did in Acts chapter 13 because he makes that same connection. And that connection is important. Over in Acts 13, are you there? Acts 13. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up here. Because I only got one verse in my notes there. But there was something I wanted to, um, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on. Acts 13. Let me back up to... Um, I told you guys 33. I think I'm going to go to Acts... I think I'm going to pick it up. I want to get the whole context here. Acts 13. I'm going to back it up to verse 26 just for the context. Paul is... is, is he's preaching, of course. And he says, men and brethren, verse 26 of Acts 13, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Oh, boy, oh, man. The prophets being read in the Sabbath for centuries. And when he came... They didn't see him. Let's not, let's not beat up on them too much. Because the scriptures are read for centuries now. In churches. And people don't see him. And people don't know him. And people still miss him. But they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And they found no cause for death in him. They asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Verse 29. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him. I'd love to say something there, but I'm I'm, I'm going to move on. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God, I love, anytime you see a verse that starts with, but God, rejoice. Amen? But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. We are his witnesses. To Who, who are the witnesses to the people? And we declare to you, glad tidings, the promise which was made to the forefathers. God has now fulfilled this for us, their children. Promises that were centuries old, promises that were a millennial old, were now being fulfilled. In that he raised up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. And we're going to be heading there. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to corruption. Now wait a minute, Paul. The psalmist said, you are my son, today I have begotten you. How do you get the resurrection out of that? Well, because Paul 
He was a Pharisee, and a Pharisee was a theologian, and a theologian understood Psalm 110. And the Pharisee understood all Walters. They should have. Obviously, we just read that a lot of them didn't. But those who did understand, oh, 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 oh. Remember, when after Jesus w- was resurrected, uh, he, he, the, the, guy, the, t- the two disciples were walking down the road to Emmaus, and Jesus', is, Jesus is, uh, he, he was hid from them. He wasn't in a different form. He, wasn't, he, was, he was Jesus. But maybe, maybe he had a hoodie on. I don't know. But, but, but they were distressed. They were, they, they were sorrowful. Maybe they never even looked up. They were just, oh, man, oh, man. And a stranger comes along side. Hey, what are you guys complaining about? What are you guys whining about? Oh, did you not hear? Did you not hear? And then the Bible says that Jesus began to expound to them about how the Messiah must suffer. And he, and he says, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, all the writings, all the Psalms, all, Jesus began to explain to them about what it was that, that, that the Messiah had to experience. And remember, after Saul became Paul, after Saul w- was struck down on that road to Damascus, he, he writes in his own testimony that, that he went, he did not confer with, uh, with, with the disciples, with the apostles right away, but Jesus drove him into the wilderness. Paul says that he went down to Arabia, to Mount Sinai. Well, it might not say at Mount Sinai, but a lot of people believe he went down to Mount Sinai because... Because that's where, where God had originally uh, revealed himself to the nation of Israel, to the people of Israel. Um, I won't go down that bunny trail. But Paul says that, that I did not receive my gospel from the men. Jesus had to take that. My point is this. Jesus had to take that Pharisee and retrain him. Paul was filled with all of this theological training. But now Jesus took him and said, okay, okay, Paul, this meant that. And this meant that. And so now Paul, when he, when he says, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that's talking about the resurrection. Just like in Psalm 110, it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit, sit at my right hand till I make an enemies your footstool. Speaking of how the fact that Jesus, what, what, what was this, he ascended into heaven after he was resurrected. He was declared to be the son of God. The son of man, the son of David, by the resurrection from the dead. Now, do you begin to understand why the resurrection is so important? The resurrection is important on a lot of levels, my friend. That's why when modern day Christians or heretics or, 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 or deniers of the resurrection try to spiritualize it, they destroy the entire foundation of the word of God. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 2. Because we're going to be hanging out here now. Because this, this is where I was going with really all of that. Are you with me? Am I, am I losing you? Okay, nobody. <laughs> I got no response there. It's scary. Well, then humor me. Because <laughs> I'm excited about this. I, I truly am. Father, I pray that you would stir our hearts to see. To see what is the hope of your calling. To understand the glorious future that we have. We sang it last week on Easter Sunday. Oh, glorious day. This is all leading to something, folks. Oh, what a day that will be. Oh, what a glorious day that will be when Jesus cracks the sky and returns to, to Jerusalem when his feet land on the Mount of Olives like it says in the book of Zechariah and, and, and the mountain splits in two and he marches into Jerusalem to sit upon the throne of David. Psalm chapter 2. I'm going to pick up the, in verse 6. Now, Paul actually just quoted verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord said to me, you, today you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's the verse Paul quotes. But I want to go into the setting of the psalm. Verse 6. Yet now, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Where is King Jesus going to rule from? Well, I know he's ruling from heaven right now. And trust me. There's a lot of people that want to just keep them there. Hello? <laughs> There's a lot of people that just want to keep them there in heaven. But I want to tell you something about the Davidic promises. I want to tell you something about the Davidic covenant. It was never meant to be simply spiritualized and allegorized away. It, it was a, a literal throne with a literal kingdom, with a literal king on a literal mountain. Yes. There are hundreds of... Of, of, of prophecies regarding the Messiah in the Old Testament. And Jesus' first uh, advent, over a hundred of them were fulfilled. There's more than two or three hundred more to, to be fulfilled. Now I want to tell you something, folks. 
If the first batch of prophecies were literally fulfilled, physically, literally, what makes you think the rest of them are just some kind of spiritual, ethereal thing? I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That was literal because they, they, Paul said that was the sign of the resurrection. That, 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 that was fulfilled. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. And the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Verse 9, that the words, you shall break them with a rod of iron. That verse is used three times in the book of Revelation about the rule of Jesus. He's going to come and return and he's going to rule with a rod of iron over the nations. Revelation 12, Revelation 19, Revelation 2. He's going to rule with a rod of iron over the nations. And you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore... <laughs> Yeah, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. We're trying to teach you something here. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. Lest he be angry. And you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. This verse. Psalm 2 verse 12. I'm going to get a little bit into the theological weeds of it a little bit. I hope you can follow me. I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. But. This verse to me has always been somewhat of an enigmatic verse. It's such a powerful declaration of the Son of God. And yet, has anyone ever noticed that this verse is never quoted in the New Testament? That bugged me for years. Why is this verse not in the New Testament? When I was a brand new believer and I began to study the word of God, I wondered why such a clear and powerful statement regarding the Son of God that is in this verse was never quoted in the New Testament. The New Testament writers quote hundreds of verses in the, of, from the Old Testament scriptures, as we know. They quote hundreds of verses, and yet this particular verse is not among them. I was always scratching my head. Why? I was baffled especially as a new believer, as to why that wasn't there in the New Testament. It took me years to study it out and figure it out and find out there is, there, 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 is a, there, there is a reason. It's a paradoxical reason. It's the reason why this is in the New Testament is both paradoxical and fascinating. The simple fact of the matter is, the New Testament writers in Jesus' day, they never saw this verse translated that way. Our, you got your Bible there? Who's got the Bible? Hold your Bible up. Our Old Testament that we have today, put your hand on the Old Testament portion of your Bible. Your Old Testament portion of the Bible that we have today is translated from what is called the Masoretic Text. The Masoretic Text was compiled and and translated a thousand years after the times of Christ, around, around 1000 AD, 1100 AD. It's the Masoretic text. That is what our Old Testament is. In Jesus' day, in the disciples' day, in the apostles' day, the common version of the Bible was known as the Septuagint. It was a Greek translation of the Hebrew. But since Greek... Was the, was the official language of the Roman Empire in so many ways. You would think it was Latin, but because, because the, 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 I don't want to get into the history of it all, really. The, the Romans took on so much of the Greek culture, and since the Greeks had already had an empire, everyone spoke Greek. It was, they were all Hellenistic. So approximately 200 years before the birth of Christ, 
70 rabbis came together and translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. That's why it's called the Septuagint. Septuagint means 70. So the common Bible in Jesus' day was the Septuagint. Here's what's fascinating. The New Testament that we have, all of the verses like we just read, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, blah, blah, blah. You know, today, all, all of the Old Testament quotations in our New Testament come from an older version of our Old Testament. Get that? Isn't that a little quirky? Isn't that a little, it's, to me it's kind of just ironic. The New Testament quotes are older than our Old Testament. By almost 1,200 years. But here's the thing. When, when, they, quote, when, they, when they translated the, the Septuagint of this psalm, they didn't really do a good job of it. They put it more into a, a transliteration kind of a thing. The Septuagint reads this way, and this is how they saw it. I said a moment ago, the reason it was never put into the New Testament is because they never saw it written this way. Because the Septuagint says, says, accept correction, lest at any time the Lord be angry and you should perish from the righteous way. Whensoever his wrath shall be suddenly kindled, blessed are they who trust in him. Instead of saying kiss the sun, it's the Septuagint says, accept correction. Yeah, they, they, never, they never saw it written, kiss the sun. The Greek, the idea of the Greek words, one of the words there for, it means child training, padeus. It means to learn from the sun. It means to learn as a son. They were trying to convey an idea in the Septuagint and not be literal. But I'm the type of guy, and I needed to know, I wanted to know this. I wanted to know why this verse was in the New Testament. That was one of the reasons. What's interesting is, is that the Latin translation... The Latin translation of the Septuagint, remember the Septuagint is Greek, the Jerome Bible, for, for many years the Bible was translated into Latin. The Latin translation was Adorante Filium, worship the sun. So the Latin, they understood what the Greek was saying, and they took the Greek and made it Adorante, Adorante Filium. Years ago, I was witnessing to a Jewish, an elderly Jewish man for many, 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 many years. I was witnessing this guy. I was, I, was, I was intriguing to him and I was puzzling to him because he was a conservative Jew. It was when I worked in a music store. He was a conservative Jew who went to, went to his conservative synagogue week after week after week. And he was intrigued that this Goyim, this Gentile kid, and I was a kid back then, knew more about his religion and prophets than he did. But he said to me one day, and I was showing him stuff in the, in, in, in the Bible. He goes, oh, I don't want to use your Bible. If you want to talk to me, I want you to use the official Bible in my synagogue, which is the JPS version, Jewish Publication Society. I said, okay. I went out and I bought myself a Jewish Publication Society Bible so I could talk to him. Now, 99.9% .9 of the JPS is the Masoretic text. It's, what, it's the same as our Old Testament. It's the Masoretic text. But a few variations because everyone has their biases. I go into the JPS version of Psalm 2 verse 12. In the King James, it says, kiss the sun. Not the JPS version. Do homage in purity. Pay homage. Pay homage in purity to God. Lest he be angry. However, both the Masoretic text and the JPS in our Bibles, the word there for, for homage is the shock in the Hebrew. It means to kiss. And the shock ba. Ba or ba is, can be translated son or heir. Problem is, it's not really a problem. In verse 7 of this psalm, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. The Hebrew word there is ben. Because the Hebrew word ben is the 99% the, the nine of the times 
used as son. Ben. You know, uh, 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 Jacob named his son Benjamin, son of my right hand. Ben is the word son, normally. But so is Bar at points. You put... You, <laughs> I won't get into that. It, it, I told you, it gets into the weeds. But Bar is also son, but Bar rightly means heir. The heir, the, the, the heir apparent to the throne. So, in the JPS version, because I went through this with my, my Jewish friend many years ago. He said, you see, the, the word here, bar, in Psalm 2.12 is, is homage. It, it, it's, it's, it's not translated son. However, in his own Bible, and in our Masoretic text, in, in, in Proverbs, uh, what, what proverb is it? it it's in uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 31, verse 2. In the JPS Bible, the very same word with the same very uh, jots and chittles, bar, is translated son. In their own Bible. In, in, in Proverbs 31. So the, my point is this. That there is absolutely justifiable and credible reasons why the Masoretic text that we have in our Old Testament translates kiss the son. And it's legitimate. Did you catch all that? Yeah. Because it all amounts to the same thing. You will pay homage to the son of God. You will submit to the Son of God. You see what the Greek was trying to... When the Greek said, uh, receive correction, or when the JPS says, uh, do homage, again, it's a Middle Eastern thing. In the Middle Eastern culture, to kiss means to submit. To kiss, you kiss a king. You bow down, you kiss, you kiss a king's feet. It's to, it's, it's to submit yourself. It's to pay homage. When you think about that, it makes it even more intriguing, if not infuriating, how Judas betrayed Jesus. You, 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 you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Think about that. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. Philippians chapter 2. We know this verse, passage very well. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make, a, till I make a, your enemy your footstool. Jesus Christ is Lord. My friends, the day is coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And not only that, he will rule this earth from Mount Zion. Because the Davidic covenant demands a literal fulfillment. We know the scripture in Luke when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and behold you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Davidic promises. Davidic covenant. Let me tell you something about the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. The new covenant our new covenant is, is, is the fulfillment and the continuation of the Abrahamic covenant and the, and the Davidic covenant. Those two covenants were unconditional and they were eternal. Did you catch that? They, uh, the angel says, he will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever and ever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The earthly kingdom reign of the Messiah is a central part of the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets. That's why Gabriel said to Mary, he shall reign on the throne of his father David. It, the, the prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah, all the prophets spoke of the great day when the Messiah would rule the earth from Mount Zion in Jerusalem. There are hundreds and hundreds of, of, of Old Testament prophecies talking about the millennium, talking about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's literal. I don't care about the amillennials who want to put it out in heaven someplace, who want to make it spiritual. It's going to be literal, just like, just like Jesus' ascension to sit at the right hand of God was literal. Just like Jesus cried out from the, from, from the, from the, from the, from the 
cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When, when, when they were crucifying him, when they pierced his hands and his feet, that was literal. I'm telling you, my friends, Jesus is coming back literally and physically to rule in a real nation over the earth from Jerusalem. Yes. It wasn't. Yes. When they talked about the covenant of David... When they talked about the covenant of David, it wasn't merely an afterlife thought or merely a spiritual thing to them. It was accepted by all the Jews, both literal and physical, which is precisely why, precisely why the disciples, after Jesus' resurrection, what do they ask him before he ascends to heaven? It says, therefore, when they came together in the book of Acts, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They had a really good reason for asking that question. And here's the thing, folks. Take note. Jesus did not question nor correct the premise of their question. He simply answers. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. The New Testament nowhere ever calls into question the hope that Israel had for the restoration of the literal kingdom of David with Messiah, son of David, sitting on his Davidic throne. Jeremiah prophesied that after the time of Jacob's trouble, you can read about this in in Jeremiah chapter 30. He he talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. But right after that time, which we know which is coming, we call it the tribulation. Jeremiah says, after they are restored... They will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Hello? The throne of David and the Davidic covenant was never meant as merely some euphemistic or allegorical thing said only in heaven or in some ethereal realm. As I I keep saying it, I'm going to keep saying it. It's literal, it's physical. And it's coming. Because it's obvious. Jesus, are you going to set up the kingdom now? It's not for you to know the times and seasons the Father has. Jesus didn't correct their premise. Oh, you got this all wrong. Let me tell you, you just, you just really misinterpret that. He didn't say that at all. And it's obvious that they, didn't, that they, they, they took Jesus literally there too. Because later on in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost... Again, from his Day of Pentecost sermon, Peter says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before him, whom heaven must receive until... Everybody shout, until, 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 until the times of the restoration of all things. What is Peter talking about? The same thing he was talking about. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Is that a different restoration of all things? They're expecting their Davidic covenant to be fulfilled. They're expecting themselves to rule the world. Oh, you're a Zionist. You better believe I'm a Zionist. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody tried to impugn me the last week. Calling me a Christian Zionist. I'm a Christian. I, never, I don't put any labels on myself. But if you're going to impugn me because I believe the Bible, I got news for you. God's a Zionist. Amen. I have set my king on my mountain in Zion. I'm trying. We can't, we can't go through it all today because it's, it's, it's huge. But I'll give you the Several layers of the onion skin. I can't see that. Okay. Marsha, show me the clock. But understand, I'm sure you do. The Davidic covenant refers to God's promises to David through Nathan the prophet. We read about them in 2 Samuel 7. But they were confirmed in 1 Chronicles 7 and 2 Chronicles 6. And then Psalm 89 is a reaffirmation of the Davidic covenant. Psalm 89 Verses 3 and 4. Put that up on the screen if you can. Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4. You there? Psalm 89, 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. 
I have sworn to who? It's not, still not up there. Ed, you can't find? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to who? 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 God made a covenant with David, just like he made with Abraham. An unconditional, everlasting covenant. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. And there's more in Psalm 89. We don't have the time to, to get to today. But I want you to understand something. Because a lot of people, here's where they go off the rails. They think that the old covenant is the Old Testament. No, 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 no. It's, it's a mix-up of the words. When the, when, when the New Testament refers to the Old Covenant, it's referring to the Mosaic Covenant. It, we read about Hebrews, about, about the new putting away the old, but it's only speaking about the Mosaic Covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, were unconditional. They were eternal. When the Bible refers to the Old Covenant, it never means the entire New Testament. How many people think the entire New Testament was, was completed and finished and fulfilled? It's absurd. And it's not even exegetically or her- hermeneutically correct. The Old Covenant, when referred to in the New Testament, is never referring to the Abrahamic Covenant or the Davidic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant was always meant to be temporary and not eternal and was very much conditional. But unless the modern church and Christians understand that the new covenant is both a realization of and an everlasting continuation of the Abrahamic and Divinic covenants, many will continue to fumble and stumble around trying to figure out what's going on with Israel. The reason they don't understand Israel is because they don't understand the covenants, plain and simple. And I'll leave it right there for now for lack of time. But I'm going to say this again. Despite the mockers, Despite the haters, despite the naysayers, Jesus will return. Na, 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 na. <laughs> Jesus will return and will sit upon an earthly throne of David from Mount Zion and make no mistake about it. Part of the Davidic promise given to David from Samuel, 2 Samuel 7.10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and they may, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. How many times in history has Israel been banished from the land? Time and time and time again. But this Davidic promise has yet to be fulfilled. But it's going to be fulfilled that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more. The Davidic covenant um, uh, maintains the land promise that was given under the Abrahamic covenant. God plants Israel in the promised land on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Period. Hosea, the prophet Hosea, and I'm coming to, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. Plain circling for landing. Prophet Hosea, Hosea, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince. Look around. Again, I understand that Jesus is king and prince. But these scriptures demand a literal fulfillment for the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Is there a king and prince in Israel today sitting on the throne of David? No. I got news for you. There wasn't one in the days of Jesus either. Herod was king of Israel, but he wasn't of the line of David. He wasn't even a Jew. He was an Edomian. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or a prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Well, they've been abiding for about 2,000 years plus, without sacrifice. Although they did offer up a Passover sacrifice last week, my friends. We're getting there. That's another sermon. We're getting there. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return. After 2,000 years, they've returned. And seek the Lord, their God, and David, their king. And they shall fear the Lord and his goodness. When? 
When? Akarit. The end of all things in the Hebrew. Not just the end of an old covenant system in 70 AD. But the end of all things. It's prophetic language. They will fulfill the Lord and His goodness in the Akarit. Yami. Yam. Days. We're going to end back over in Psalm chapter 2. Yet I have set my king on my holy mount of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. The ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Jesus isn't coming back as some effeminate snowflake, my friends. (laughs) I said Jesus is not coming back as some effeminate snowflake. Some wuss. He's coming back to rule and reign upon the throne of David with a rod of iron. He's going to dash his enemies to pieces. Kiss the sun. (laughs) Oh, I know. I hear every devil in hell screaming at me right now. They don't want to hear this message. Verse 10, now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. That's what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to give you some instruction. I'm trying to give you some wisdom. Kiss the sun. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled, but for a moment. <laughs> Jesus is coming back, having tread the... Fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. He's coming back in wrath against his enemies. He's not coming back as some pussy-footing hippie. That's what the world wants to make him. I heard some snowflake last week complaining about a certain politician in a certain position. Saying, you don't represent my Jesus. That's the problem, honey. You created your own Jesus. Paul says, if anyone comes to you preaching another Jesus that we have not preached, from preaching another gospel which we have not preached, let him be accursed. He's going to dash his enemies to pieces. You shall break them with a rod of iron. Those of you who are anti-Semitic, Repent and kiss the bride. Those of you who are anti Zionist, repent and kiss the bride. And I'm going to do one more thing before I close. I'm serving notice on all the liars and deceivers who are trying to manipulate and rewrite history. Let me make it really simple. Jesus was not a Palestinian. Notice that lately? Oh, yeah. They're trying to turn Jesus into a Palestinian. Take away his Jewish roots. But you see, of the flesh, he is of the the lineage of David. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root and offspring of Jesse. Do you ever wonder why those genealogies were so important? Now you know why. Because they want to produce doctrines of demons and deny the Lord his true heritage because they hate Israel. And they want to destroy Israel. And they want Israel out of the land. And all the lies you hear. Oh, I know there are people squirming. (laughs) I know it. Feeling anger and rage. Repent. Kiss the sun. Lest he become angry and you perish in the way. Because 
He's coming back. And Revelation 19.15 says, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Psalm 2. For the day is coming, my friends. The day of the Lord is coming, and you will pay homage to the Son. Pay it now. Pay, pay homage. To, kiss the Son. Well, it's still cold today. <laughs> today is the day of salvation. You will pay homage to the Son with fear and trembling. You will kiss the Son. Stand together, please. And I wish I had the time to go more into the Davidic covenant, to get into talking about the millennial age that is coming, that some today want to deny as a fairy tale. I believe the Word of God. I believe in the plain reading sense of the Word of God. That's all you'll ever get from me, folks. Nothing less. Amen? Amen. Father, I pray that you would take the branding iron of the Holy Ghost and burn this word into our hearts. <laughs> Set this word upon our hearts like a seal of your love. Because I do kiss the sun. I do pay homage to you, Jesus. I do thank you for your salvation and for your hope. And I know that my knee will willingly bow and I will willingly kiss your feet. I pray for those who have heard this message, Lord, that you would pierce their spirit and pierce their hearts with the living word of God, the pure word of God which is able to save their souls. Father, do a work in this day that only you can do. I pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. And amen. Amen.